Thank you so much for being here. It's so great to see all of you arriving. Um, as that happens and more folks join us, I will kick us off for the evening. Um, okay. Okay. Here we go. All right. Good evening, everyone. I'm Arielle Cates. I'm the Director of Programming at Village Preservation, and I am here with my colleague, Lena Rubin, who is our Programs Assistant. Uh, we are so glad that you are all here with us this evening. Uh, just a little bit about Village Preservation. We have been documenting, celebrating, and fighting for the preservation of Greenwich Village, the East Village, and NoHo since 1980. We work to expand and extend landmark and zoning protections and stop inappropriate development while also encouraging appropriate development in our neighborhoods. We host roughly 75 programs a year, all of which are now virtual and most of which are free and open to the public. Our events are meant to illuminate the cultural and architectural heritage, history and depth and the value of preservation in our communities. We are a nonprofit membership based organization, so your involvement and support mean the world to us. Uh, you can learn more at our wonderful new website, villagepreservation.org, and please consider becoming a member or making a donation if you're able at villagepreservation.org slash donate. So um, lots to talk about this evening. We are delighted that tonight's event is a part of October, which is 10 years old, and that we have two wonderful partners to whom we're so grateful. The Monticelli Press is offering a special coupon code for 20% off Stanford White in detail. Uh, I will put the information, that information in the chat for all of you. Um, and we're also so grateful to our partners at Judson Memorial Church. Since its inception, Judson Memorial Church has sought to continually expand the meaning of the word sanctuary with its 132 year old landmark building, which I'm sure we will hear some things about this evening, um, serving as a safe haven for artists, immigrants and unfettered innovation in the realms of spirituality, justice making and creativity. There's so much history and so much happening at Judson, and I hope that you'll all join us on Thursday, November 9th uh, for our joint event, Embodying Sanctuary, Faith, Activism, and Creativity at Judson Memorial Church, where we will delve into all of that together. So I will link that in the chat for you as well. Um, just a little bit of Zoom protocol, though Lena and I won't be visible during the talk, Please feel free to use the chat to say hi, tell us where you're joining from and if you have any issues or thoughts. Uh, but if you have any questions specifically about the talk for Sam, please use the Q&A function and we will get to as many of those as we can following the talk. So without further ado, I am very pleased to introduce tonight's speaker. Samuel G. White, consul consulting partner at PBDW Architects, has practiced architecture since 1974. His diverse portfolio of educational, institutional, and residential projects focuses on designs that introduce new interventions to historic settings in ways that both reinforce and reinterpret their contexts. Recently completed work includes restoration of the cast iron facades of 462 Broadway, um, and current projects include the modernization of Stanford White's Astor Courts in Rhinebeck, among many others. A national academi acad academician, is that, how do you pronounce that? The academician. Yeah. Sure, great, that. Uh, and a trustee or advisor to a number of preservation and arts organizations. He is the author of The Houses of McKim, Mead, and White, McKim, Mead, and White, The Masterworks, Stanford White Architect and Nice House. Um, Mr. White re lectures regularly to museum and preservation groups. So I will let him do that precisely for us. Sam, take us away. Thank you so much. Well, thank you, Ariel. You can see me now? Yes. Good. Well, Thank you for that introduction. Thank Village Preservation very much for organizing this talk. And uh, thank you very much, all of you out there, for uh, being interested enough to join us. 
uh, the book that Ariel mentioned, uh, which is this one, this is Stanford White in detail, uh, I'll say two things about it. One is it's the first of the Stanford White books that uh, we've done that you can actually pick up with one hand. Uh, and the second is uh, that it keeps a very tight focus on the uh, decorative uh, ornamental uh, elements that sort of enrich and animate Stanford White's work. Uh, and tonight, uh, I would like to, uh, to consider the broader themes that really connect his work across the span of his career. Those themes uh, include his um, collaboration with other artists and architects, uh, the unique way in which he used ornament uh, in his architecture, uh, and then most particularly, uh, the source of the inspiration for his extraordinary designs. Uh, the, uh, my, I think that that source, really the inspiration arises from two uh, factors, uh, two elements, his memory and his imagination. And, you know, we all have memory and imagination to some degree, uh, but in Stanford White's case, the combination was just rocket fuel. Um, he was able to uh, sort of translate historic precedents and forms into raw material and then reinterpret them uh, in designs that were uh, simultaneously uh, sort of uh, reassuringly familiar and uh, strikingly original uh, and always possessing a greatly high level of energy. Um, and his, uh, the magnificent, really remarkable things that he produced using those uh, uh, skills made him one of the most important designers in the history of American arts. Well, the, uh, I'm going to share screen now and see if I can come up with a, let's just get rid of this. Excuse me for one sec. We're, there we are. Okay. Well, the facts of uh, Stanford White's life and work are fairly straightforward. Um, he was born in New York in 1853. He was murdered also in New York in 1906 at the age of 53. Uh, when he was 19, uh, he was apprenticed to Henry Hobson Richardson, uh, the most important living American architect at that time. Uh, White proceeded to work for Richardson for six years, uh, rising to become Richardson's principal ass uh, assistant, uh, and then leaving in uh, 1878 for a 14-month sabbatical to Europe. Uh, he uh, returned to New York in 1879 to join up with uh, William Rutherford Mead and Charles Follin McKim. Uh, Sam, I'm, yes. I'm, I'm so sorry. We are actually not able to see your screen share. Well, let's start. Let's start sorry about share. that. Okay, we're going to just, you've heard it. So, um, Let's just see what I can do here. Screen share. There we go. Okay. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for stopping me on that. Oh, of course. <laughs> the count. Um, what the, um, he returned in 1879 to join up with uh, William Rutherford Mead and Charles Follin McKim. Uh, and they had a, uh, sort of a combination of compatible personalities and different, but uh, I would say complementary artistic temperaments, uh, a combination that was an instant success. Uh, and over the next 25 years, uh, McKim, Mead and White grew from a small atelier uh, to become the largest and most famous architecture office in the country, if not in the world. Uh, well, the integration of uh, memory and imagination begins with White building on a store of memories at the very start of his career when he is uh, still apprenticed to Richardson. I mean, he doesn't, uh, he's basically got his eyes open and he is paying attention. And uh, for example, this picture shows him in his early 20s, still working for Richardson. And while he did that, uh, in the mid 1870s, he and his then friends, uh, Meade and McKim, uh, took what they would later refer to as their celebrated New England walking tour <clears throat> uh, up to Salem, Massachusetts and Portsmouth, New Hampshire uh, to see examples of federal period architecture. Uh, and this 
building, which is in uh, New Hampshire, uh, made a significant impression on Stanford White. I mean, I think he was quite impressed by the, uh, the proportions of it, the elegance of it, the uh, restrained use of uh, ornament. Um, and then in particular, the front door with its side lights, its transom and the porch that was in semi-enclosed with, um, uh, with lattice. And uh, that impression sort of resurfaces 25 years later in a house that he designed uh, for Charles Dana Gibson on 73rd Street off Lexington Avenue. Uh, the same uh, restrained use of ornament, the same smooth brickwork, and the same uh, sort of arrangement around the front door of side lights and, uh, and a transom with a very thin uh, leaded uh, glass in each of these elements. Um, the rest of that he used again almost the same period. This is the early 1900s at this point, 25 years later, um, in a house for James Breeze in Southampton. It's called The Orchard. And the design of the house consisted of a series of pavilions that were linked by hyphens. Uh, the hyphens were designed as sort of quasi outdoor spaces with uh, the tile floor, the uh, lattice on the wall, and then that really wonderful federal period uh, doorway, which either was a piece of salvage or something that was created from scratch. At this point, he knew how to draw it and, uh, uh, and they could actually build it. But it gives you this wonderful sense of a processional passage as you're going from one part of the house to another. In this case, what lies beyond is the music room. Uh, on his sabbatical in Europe, he filled dozens of sketchbooks. Uh, and uh, he was particularly taken by the Chateau de Plessis in northwestern France, uh, by the, particularly by the uh, uh, animated uh, roof line with its uh, uh, punctuation of dormers, uh, and then uh, the texture of the underside of that projecting bay on the left and the arch over the door in the corner. Uh, and about a year after he made this drawing, they reappear in one of his first designs, the interior courtyard of the uh, Newport Casino. And you can see the same punctuation of the skyline, the same texture, particularly in the spandrel over the entry door in the same uh, arch. So it's a, uh, this was a direct translation from the sketch to the architecture. Uh, that trip to Europe in uh, 1878 to 79 included a little sub trip down to the south of France with Charles McKim uh, and Augustus St. Gaudens. And St. Gaudens made a medal <clears throat> to commemorate the trip of these three friends. All three, incidentally, were redheads. Uh, and you see McKim in the lower right. You see uh, St. Gaudens in the lower left with the pointed beard. And then you see Stanford White at the top looking as if he's just stepped on a live wire, which is probably pretty much how he was all the time. Um, in the upper right, you see a little uh, sketch of a uh, church front. And that is the uh, Cathedral of Saint Gilles du Gard, a town just north of Avignon. Uh, Stanford White saw this and he wrote back to his mother uh, that this was the finest piece of architecture in all of France. Well, Stanford White was given to rather uncritical superlatives, but it is an extraordinary piece of architecture. And again, 25 years later, Stanford White sort of pulls this up uh, and modifies it and adds it to the front of St. Bartholomew's Church. Now, today it's at uh, Park Avenue and 51st Street, but it was originally at Madison Avenue and 47th Street on a St. Bartholomew's that was designed by Renwick. Um, when the congregation moved in the 20s to uh, this building designed by Goodhue, they insisted that the new building incorporate uh, the entry porch as designed by Stanford White. <coughs> well, Stanford White and St. Gaudens collaborated from the very beginning and they would continue to collaborate through their uh, entire lives. Uh, their first collaboration was the uh, Farragut Monument in Madison Square. And um, this was St. Gordon's first public commission. Uh, and the statue he did of uh, Farragut really changed the course of American public sculpture in the degree to which it was animated and engaged and sort of captured a psychological moment. Uh, Farragut is just about to raise, he sees something on the horizon, he's just about to raise his uh, uh, binoculars to see what it is. Um, the base was designed by Stanford White, and it probably did not have uh, changed the course of the design of sculptural bases in America because uh, very few architects of the caliber of Stanford White uh, ever tried to design a base. This is an extraordinary work of design and the degree to which it uh, engages the viewer, invites the viewer to sit, uh, invites the viewer to look and to read. Uh, if you, interestingly, if you want to see the difference between Stanford White and uh, Charles McKim, 
uh, look at the, Far at the Sherman statue on Fifth Avenue and 59th Street, where the base there is by McKim and is an example, uh, not of this kind of uh, engaging uh, design, but of just perfect proportions. Uh, well, within um, Richardson's office, Stanford White uh, learned the value of working with other artists. Uh, he had been in charge of the construction of Trinity Church in Boston, and that had uh, a number of artists working on the interior. Um, here, uh, when White returns to New York, he uh, does a project with a group called the Associated Artists, which were uh, led by Louis Comfort, Louis Comfort Tiffany, who was in the lower left. Uh, it has Lockwood DeForest in the upper left, who looks like he's going to a costume party. Um, it has uh, Samuel Coleman, a painter in the upper right, and then Candace Wheeler, who designed uh, fabrics in the lower right. Uh, and they were interior decorators. They did uh, the Mark Twain House in Hartford. They did a room in the, in the White House in Washington, DC. They did the Havemeyer House in New York. And Stanford White joined them for a single project, which was uh, the 7th Regiment Armory Veterans Room, which uh, is considered to be uh, the finest uh, aesthetic period room in America uh, and is a room that certainly redefines the concept of visual overload. I mean, when you come in there, you don't know where to start, but this is a work of pure imagination. This is, there's no precedent for what you're looking at here. This was completely invented and Stanford White was said to have been involved in the architectural aspects of it. Well, in Richardson's office, the architect was also taught to lead uh, this uh, team of artists rather than uh, to just to be part of them. And uh, Stanford White got his chance to do that uh, in many projects, but this one is down in Greenwich Village. It's the Church of the Ascension uh, at Fifth Avenue and 10th Street. And uh, the background is that the church had been built uh, by Upjohn for a congregation that insisted that there not only be no chancel to avoid any popish doings, but that there be no chance of ever building a chancel. So he backed the rectory right up to the uh, end of the nave. And um, so 40 years later, the congregation was interested in uh, a uh, more a sec a, a service that was more closely related to the Roman Catholic one, I would say. And um, so they hired Stanford White to create a chancel where Upjohn had made sure there could be none. And Stanford White sort of recruited uh, the uh, Maitland Armstrong was in the lower left to do the mosaics. He recruited uh, Louis St. Gaudens, the brother of Augustus, to do those uh, bas relief angels. Uh, and then uh, John Lafarge, the painter, to do the great uh, mural of uh, the rising Christ uh, over the altar. White did the architectural setting and conceived of the whole thing. Uh, but this was an uh, example of Stanford White leading uh, a group of very talented people to uh, create something that many think people thought could not be done. Well, his most brilliant collaborations were not so much with other artists as with his two partners, uh, William Mead on the left and uh, Charles McKim on the right. Uh, and when they started, they had a, a office, as I say, about 16 people. It might've been maybe 300 square feet, uh, but everybody was on top of everybody. And I think in the very earliest work, you get the sense that there is this incredible sort of struggle for participation. Uh, everybody wants to contribute to the designs that they had. And a wonderful example of that is this very early house in Newport, which is done for Samuel Tilton. Uh, you're looking at the south elevation here, and what you're looking at uh, demonstrates that Charles McKim was completely in control of the south elevation. He, the great gable that organizes the whole form, uh, the uh, boldly asymmetrical two-story bay, uh, the line of the, the horizontal line of windows at the third floor, that's all very typical McKim. But as you go around the house, around the sides, you start to see that Stafford White is kind of clawing his way back into the game. Uh, and so uh, on the west elevation, you have that wonderful scraffito panel on the upper right with its shield. Uh, that's made out of pebbles and glass and seashells that are stuck into wet cement. Um, on the left, you see half timbering filled with uh, pebble dash. And then at the lower left, you see that window with tiny, tiny little panes and that interest in very dense texture. This is Stanford White asserting what would be characteristics of his work throughout his career. 
Uh, by the time you get around to the north elevation, Stanford White is in control, and uh, there is this gigantic uh, sgraffito panel where the um, elements include bits of broken beer bottles. I mean, you get the sense that Stanford White must have climbed up on the scaffold himself because there's no way you could have communicated uh, this design either uh, verbally or by a drawing. Well, once you got to the inside of the Tilton House, uh, Stanford White was unopposed. Uh, McKim and Meade recognized that they did not have a flair for interiors. Uh, that's why they brought Stanford White into the partnership. And <clears throat> what he did here was to sort of create an encyclopedia of, of finishes of ordinary pine. I mean, it's chiseled, polished, buffed, sanded, shaped into every conceivable surface finish. Uh, and it's just a wonderful house to go through. Again, visual overload and a work of pure imagination. Um, White collaborated within the office um, sort of vertically as well as horizontally. Uh, this is a picture of an architect named Joseph Morrow Wells. Uh, Wells was the first uh, architect to be hired by McKim, Mead, and White, and he worked there until his death in uh, 1890. Wells was an exceptionally talented individual, and uh, to sort of summarize Wells, in a, but he was a, he's an ornery son of a gun. To summarize him in a nutshell, uh, Wells was at one point offered a partnership, which is really a measure of how good he was, uh, but he turned it down saying that uh, he would never put his name on so much damn bad work. Uh, so that is Joe Wells. He was Mr. Inside. He would love to work with Stanford White. They were a terrific team, but he did not want to uh, be the public face of the firm. But <clears throat> one of the projects in which they collaborated was the Villard Houses up on uh, 47th Street and Madison Avenue. Uh, White um, arranged the general plan of this to be uh, five separate houses organized to appear to be a single grand palazzo. Uh, and then White went off to the west uh, to ride uh, horses with his brother, <coughs> Richard, and uh, leaving Wells to uh, come up with the elevations. And uh, at that time, McKim, uh, Mead, and White were doing sort of neo um, uh, Richardsonian elevations, sort of a Romanesque style. And, Wells thought that this was inappropriate going forward. He advocated the use of a Renaissance style and it was approved. And uh, Wells proceeded to develop the facades of the Villard houses uh, using the details of the Palazzo della Cancelleria in Rome. Well, White returns from the West and collaborates with Wells on the interior, uh, which is sort of a, not only sort of the combination of memory and imagination at this point, but also uh, the other vital ingredient uh, is the apparently bottomless pocketbook of <coughs> uh, Henry Villard. Uh, the uh, stair hall here is covered with Sienna marble, which is very expensive material. The windows in the background were done by uh, Maitland Armstrong again. Uh, look at the column capital in the upper right uh, with its upturned volutes, and then that rosette uh, in the center. That's a wagon wheel. Uh, Villard's fortune came from railroads. And then look at the balusters down below with the sort of uh, acanthus leaves in shallow relief, almost like sort of uh, wonderful damask napkins with a acanthus pattern in them. I mean, just every time you place you turn in this house, you see more details. Downstairs, <clears throat> the doors have this, these arabesques of uh, bronze carpet or upholstery tacks uh, creating these patterns, the wonderful light fixtures and uh, mosaics running all over the place. On the stair, on the wall of the main stair, uh, there is this clock designed by Stanford White, which has uh, figures, uh, zodiac figures, uh, carved by Augustus St. Caudens. Uh, again, a collaboration, but a very high level uh, of imagination. Well, as I say, Wells died in 1890, and that was terrible for Stanford White because they had worked so well together. Um, he is buried in. Um, Medford, Massachusetts in this uh, municipal graveyard there. And uh, until about a year ago, his gravestone, which was carved by Augustus St. Gordon's and designed by Stanford White was lying broken in the mud and a group of us found it and were able to raise the money to have it uh, reinstalled, restored and cleaned up. And it was a, it's really worth a visit because it's a, it sort of connects those three extremely important architects in a single uh, element. Well, the death of Wells was a setback for White, but White could do it alone. And see what White could do alone. Uh, you might take a look at uh, this house, which is in a place called Cornwall, Pennsylvania, which is near Lancaster. 
<clears throat> it's the Percy Alden house called the Alden Villa. Uh, and Cornwall must be, uh, you know, five, six, seven hour train trip from New York. I can't believe that there were direct uh, connections to Cornwall. And so when this commission came in, uh, I'll bet that uh, McKim and Meade decided that this was really a job for the younger partner and they sent him down to the railroad station to uh, head off to uh, Cornwall. White takes this five, six or seven hour trip, meets with Percy Alden, looks at the site, goes back to the railroad station uh, to take the five, six or seven hour trip back to New York. And I am convinced that on that return trip, White designed this house because uh, it is everything that he was interested in and not what McKim was interested in at the time. So uh, you see this sort of complex form rather than the great single gable. Uh, you see the, uh, the sort of the medieval English port cochere with the half timbering, uh, the uh, arch over the stair window with uh, lattice on one side. Uh, around the house, there are these scrofito panels, uh, both as panels and then as this wonderful soffit on the uh, roof overhang. Um, there is this extraordinary uh, bay which transforms itself into a tower at the top of the house with this uh, roof that is like a, a candle snuffer, uh, but with two different roof pitches and the intersection of which is picked up with that copper flashing, making for a, an unexpectedly decorative detail. Uh, the top of it is crowned with this sort of starburst of wire. And then there are those two muscular columns supporting the roof. I mean, Stanford White's architecture was interactive. You looked at it and it kind of looked back at you. And this is an example of it. Well, in addition to being interested in uh, the architecture of medieval architecture of France, the uh, architecture of New England, uh, Stanford White was interested in Byzantine architecture. He was interested in uh, elements of Islamic architecture as well. Here's a picture of White uh, and a trip to, to Egypt. He's got his what looks like a six-year-old, five or six-year-old son uh, sitting on his lap. His wife is behind him, but behind her is an element from uh, Islamic uh, construction called the Mashrabiya screen. And uh, when it's used in its um, original setting, it has the advantage of giving you visual privacy while allowing uh, for light to penetrate and air to circulate. But what interested White about the Mashrabiya screen was the way uh, if you pass light through it, it to breaks the light up in a really uh, specular, interesting way. Uh, and he uses that in the entrance hall of the Alden Villa uh, at the bottom of the staircase. In fact, he uses it in every single one of his early designs. Uh, here you see it. Um, but he's also doing something else in this entrance hall. Uh, he's using, uh, for example, the ceiling is a, uh, based on a plate uh, in a book called The Elements of Arab Art that was published in Paris in 1850. The light fixtures look like they're taken out of some uh, uh, wonderful room in uh, Morocco. And, uh, uh, but the space itself uh, is a space that's uh, aiming towards compression, both uh, sort of physically and visually. It's a tight space, there's a lot going on. Uh, you come in the front door and you're compressed. Uh, and what White is setting up is that architecture of procession that is based on the rhythms of compression and release. So you uh, enter this space, you turn right, and this is what you walk into, this great three-story hall. Uh, and again, you see uh, sort of elements of White's art. The uh, half timbering uh, has been domesticated, I would say. The uh, medieval fireplace has been domesticated. There is this wonderful entire wall of uh, stained glass. The uh, panels in the half timbering uh, are this sort of uh, caramel color with gold leaf uh, stars uh, laid onto it. It's a quite uh, extraordinary space with a high level of detail. Um, the imagination uh, continues. This is the dining room uh, where the ceiling consists of uh, fishing net, which has been glued uh, to the plaster. Uh, the upper walls are uh, woven cane, the lower walls are marquetry blocks, and then the sideboard shows White's interest in exploring what I'll call the kind of the estuarial uh, middle ground between architecture and furniture, that uh, it's clearly something that is built into the room, but if you look at the legs, it appears to be a freestanding sideboard. Um, this is again uh, something that he would be using over and over again, not literally, but as a theme, this, this uh, architecture, uh, furniture, middle zone. Uh, there is one painted room in the house, and here you get to see Stanford White's interest in uh, so tightly reeded bundled moldings. If you 
particularly if you look at the uh, frame around the mirror on the left, uh, that is exactly what he uses in some of his frames that he designed uh, with those beading and the, and the tightly bundling of, of profiles. Um, the frame on the right is a more Renaissance-based frame, which he also designed. That encloses a bas-relief by Augustus St. Gaudens, uh, which was a wedding present to Stanford White celebrating his marriage uh, to Bessie Spring Smith in February 1884. Uh, this suddenly put uh, Stanford White into a sort of no longer New York's most eligible bachelor league, I would say, and um, they went off to Europe for a three-month uh, honeymoon, uh, traveling as far east as Greece, uh, possibly as far west as Spain. Uh, they may have gone to the south shore of the Mediterranean to look at the Morocco or Tunisia, that I'm not sure of, but they definitely spent most of their time traveling up and down the peninsula in Italy. And I think it was here that Stanford White sort of came to the conclusion that, that his mission was going to be uh, to transform uh, New York, which was a pretty ugly place uh, when he started to work uh, into a city uh, that had the sort of visual aspirations uh, of a European capital. <clears throat> so he took the, uh, this church is the uh, Santa Maria in Cosmodon. You may know it uh, if you took your 12 year old there to stick his or, hand, his or her hand in the lion's mouth. It's the thing that if you're lying, it's supposed to chop off the hand, which uh, it's a real tourist trap, but White takes that tower and um, he plants it uh, just south of Washington Square on the Judson Memorial Church, which is one of our sponsors tonight. <clears throat> and it's, this is not, uh, he makes it a little bit smaller. It's not radically changed, uh, but it is a, a sort of wonderful thing to see as you're coming down uh, into Greenwich Village. Uh, White then takes the entrance porch to that uh, church, to the Santa Maria, and uh, which is rather plain. And he sort of gives the Judson something that shows he's swinging for the fences. Um, this is this uh, just absolutely over the top uh, sort of bit of Renaissance uh, architectural sculpture. And it is what uh, makes the walk that plus the, the, the very rich uh, rustication, which is uh, cast uh, terracotta uh, on either side of the door, uh, makes the walk down that street uh, so pleasant. <clears throat> well, my favorite bit of this sort of memory imagination uh, synthesis or uh, amalgam uh, are these two buildings here. Uh, on the left is a building called uh, Loggia del Consiglio, the Porch of the Lawyers, uh, which is in Verona. Uh, and on the right, uh, you probably recognize, is the Torre Orologio, uh, the clock tower in St. Mark's Square in Venice. And White inhales these two buildings, just, just takes it in. And then what he exhales is this building. This is the headquarters for the uh, New York Herald newspaper uh, at the intersection of 6th Avenue and Broadway at 35th Street. Uh, and this was a building that uh, McKim considered to be the finest piece of architecture produced by that firm. It is just an extraordinary and a totally original uh, synthesis of uh, two familiar buildings with the bell ringers up at the top, the uh, arches, the wonderful uh, uh, curved lint pediments over the windows. Um, it had a complete newspaper operation. Uh, offices and press room, uh, co copy rooms were upstairs. The uh, press, printing presses were downstairs in the basement. You could actually see the newspaper being produced. And um, I deeply regret that this building is no longer there, uh, particularly when you consider the buildings that uh, were erected to replace it. Well, on that honeymoon, as I say, White may or may not have gone to Spain, but <clears throat> certainly by looking at architecture books, he knew of this building in Seville. This was the tower uh, of the cathedral in Seville. The tower is known as the Giralda, uh, G-I-R-A-L-D-A, which means uh, weather vane. And um, this was an Islamic tower on a mosque when it started um, many centuries before. And then uh, as the Moors were expelled from, Greece, from uh, Spain, it was Christianized and uh, got a more Renaissance uh, coating as it went up higher, uh, finally sort of topped off with this revolving uh, piece of sculpture uh, of the archangel. I'll tell you which way uh, the wind was blowing. And uh, White took that and he translated it into his more Renaissance idiom. This is in collaboration with Wells. Uh, and so it's, a, it's slender, 
uh, and it's also more vertical. Uh, this is the difference, I'd say, between uh, steel framing in the case of the uh, tower on the right and load-bearing masonry in the tower on the left. Uh, and then he tops it not with the archangel, uh, but with a uh, significantly underdressed uh, Diana of the Hunt. Uh, this was uh, received uh, controversially. There were uh, people who thought that this was uh, inappropriate. It was the first nude uh, public sculpture in America. And then there were others who were delighted by it. But it was this sort of perfect element to top off a perfect tower, which topped off, in fact, a perfect building. This is the Madison Square Garden, uh, the building that really changed New Yorkers' expectations of uh, what uh, they should demand from uh, architecture that occupied the public street. I mean, this building sort of gave back uh, in pleasure as much as it took up in real estate. And uh, it transformed uh, New York, the skyline, the tower was the tallest element for a while, uh, it trans transformed the street uh, with its arcade and its wonderful uh, terracotta ornament. And it transformed Stanford White into the most uh, visible architect in New York and commissions started coming in everywhere. He was now uh, the man to go to. Uh, and one of the men that went to him was <coughs> Henry McCracken, uh, the figure on the right, who was the chancellor of what was then called City University of New York, now called NYU. Uh, NYU was down on Washington Square in this building designed by Town and Davis in 1833. Uh, called the main building. And um, McCracken, though, had ambitions to transform uh, City University, which he then changed to New York University, uh, into a research university, really on the model of those great German research universities. This is exactly what Columbia was doing at the time. Uh, and, but to do that, he needed more space than he thought was available uh, in uh, Greenwich Village. I realized that there is a, uh, uh, an irony there, but uh, he looked around and uh, found a 43 acre site up in the Bronx uh, called the Molly Estate and bought that and then hired Stanford White to design not only a master plan for the new university, but to design uh, the first five buildings that he was able to build there, of which the principal building uh, is the Gould Memorial Library, which you see here. Uh, NYU, as you may know, bailed out of the Bronx in 1972. Uh, this campus is now occupied by the Bronx Community College, but the Gould Memorial Library is still the centerpiece of the campus, even though it is lightly used. But here you can see Stanford White's uh, use of ornament. He has this very dense ornament, which he is using, uh, relieved by uh, passages of relatively uh, plain brick. It's actually uh, lightly uh, ranged uh, Roman brick uh, or uh, perfectly smooth limestone. And uh, uh, again, uh, he's working on compression and release here in visual terms. Um, well, the, this is a rotunda library. It was a, there were two choices for libraries in, in those days for university libraries. And one was the Basilica Library, which uh, you might see in uh, some places, but the more popular choice was the rotunda. And the rotunda uh, meant that you had to go back and look at the uh, Pantheon in Rome. Uh, so uh, this is the kind of the granddaddy of all of the rotunda libraries. And what's interesting is that different architects looking at the Pantheon would sort of take different lessons from it. That McKim, uh, who was doing the library up at Columbia University at exactly the same time that White was doing uh, the library uh, for NYU. But Kim looked at the Pantheon and what he saw was this wall of columns that sort of framed and closed off and, uh, and sort of established the edge of a uh, urban square. Uh, and that's exactly what he did up at Columbia. He didn't need the pediment. He wanted, in fact, increased the number of columns because he wanted something to really close off that much larger uh, open space up at Columbia. Uh, White looked at the Pantheon, not so much directly, but really through the eyes of Thomas Jefferson, who had taken the Pantheon and translated it into his rotunda at the University of Virginia in Charlottesville. And um, what Jefferson saw and what White saw in Jefferson was that the rotunda could become a kind of a, a semi-rural Palladian villa. 
uh, an object that by its foreground quality and its, and its ele just its own elegance uh, sort of defined the space that it occupied. And um, that's what he did up at, that's what White did at uh, NYU. But uh, to this, he, he went beyond Jefferson. He added this sort of extraordinary uh, level of ornament here. What he's doing is he's, he's taking this ornament where it occurs and he is uh, creating a texture uh, that is so, so rich that it's at the point of saturation. Uh, you just can't imagine sort of adding another element. Look at the chenot on top of that pediment. Look at the uh, fish scale uh, copper shingles on the dome. Uh, this is Stanford White at work. All right, Stanford White at work inside uh, shows this great entrance hall with the staircase going up and you would climb the staircase and it's a little narrow and it's a little long and it's a little tall and it's a little steep but you get to the top and you'd be a little bit out of breath and you'd go through those doors uh, that are straight ahead and this is what you come into again this is Stanford White's arch processional architecture of compression and release and there's nobody who comes into this space for the first time who doesn't just gasp it is absolutely magnificent and this is what it looks like today. Well, White was able to uh, be inspired uh, by his memory of other countries as well as Italy. Uh, this is the Grand Trianon, the building in Versailles that was built so that Henry the, Louis XIV the could entertain his mistresses. And uh, uh, White took this building with its paired columns, flanking arched windows, its one story, uh, basically horizontal massing and its balustrade. Uh, and he uh, just reused that up in Rhinebeck, New York in what was originally called the Ferncliff Casino, a building that was built to entertain the weekend guests of John Jacob Astor IV. Um, now this is the uh, outside of it, but inside uh, it has nothing to do with what Louis XIV had. You have this uh, wonderful, a great ballroom hall that you could practically take helicopter lessons in. But look at the elements that White is using to uh, create the space. The plaster ornament around that shallow dome uh, is like the frame around a Botticelli painting. The uh, column capitals have are called French Ionic with those uh, dangling tassels. And then the uh, French doors uh, are uh, really more American. That shallow arch uh, transom over the French doors uh, recalls the celebrated New England walking tour. Um, the, uh, man the mantle is uh, sort of a kind of uh, reproduction tricked up uh, Renaissance mantle, but of a very, it's interesting, of a very primitive kind of uh, uh, idiom rather than the highly developed idiom of say the plaster work. So he's, he's moving not only sort of across cultures, but kind of across uh, registers to uh, create this space. Uh, the building <coughs> has an indoor tennis court, which is a work of uh, pure engineering done with the Guastavino uh, brothers, but it's an elegant one indeed. Uh, clearly Stanford White uh, had something to say about the architecture. And then it has this swimming pool, which is really like something out of a sort of the, the Turkish bath of your dreams. I mean, this just serene space with this a body of water, this wonderful light coming in over the white marble uh, and animated by those columns, which have uh, the pairs of dancing dolphins. Uh, it's, a, uh, it's just a little bit of animation that just makes the whole space work. Well, another characteristic of Stanford White's work across his career is his ability to take a program and not only design a building to accommodate the program, but to design a building that really expresses the spirit of that program. Uh, and I think an example of that is uh, the Century Association on 43rd Street, where this was a club that members were uh, artists, painters, sculptors, uh, poets, journalists, architects, uh, basically people in the arts. And uh, the facade that Stanford White creates here is uh, a facade that suggests that what's going on inside this building uh, is replicating the kind of the artistic fervor of Florence in the 15th century. Uh, and then, you know, 20 blocks to the south on Gramercy Park, Stanford White did the Players Club, um, which was a club for actors. And in the late 19th century, uh, acting was a highly precarious profession. Uh, and so uh, what White did was to create these front doors that suggest uh, a safe haven on the other side of them, a really a world of, of repose and security. Uh, and 
uh, for actors, that must have been a very welcome sight indeed. Moving back uptown again uh, to 50 to 60th Street and Fifth Avenue, White designed the Metropolitan Club for uh, what was at that point New York's commercial uh, banking elite. <clears throat> These were the very, very richest uh, people in New York City and to give them their uh, clubhouse, White took uh, details from the uh, Palazzo Farnese in Rome for the exterior. And then he created this tremendous gate uh, right at the sidewalk. Uh, the procession here was that the member would <clears throat> arrive by carriage, the gates would swing open, the carriage would go in and turn around and deposit the member at the front door. But um, to be in exchange for what was a slightly antisocial uh, private uh, circulation path, what White is doing is making this incredible gift to the public, to those of us who actually walk on the sidewalk. Uh, this is you know, architectural generosity uh, at its sort of highest level. Well, the member, meanwhile, we've left him at the front door. He would go in, uh, go through that triumphal arch, uh, enter the great uh, marble hall, and feel as though uh, the clubhouse that he was in sort of perfectly expressed his own sense of self-esteem. And in those days, it was all guys. Well, processional architecture goes downtown as well. And this is, I'd say, practically one of the most significant buildings or structures uh, at street level in New York City. This is the Washington Memorial Arch. It was built for processions. Originally, it was designed and built as a uh, paper mache uh, triumphal arch that uh, so terminated the parade that celebrated the 150th anniversary of the birth of George Washington. And uh, it was so popular that they made it out of marble, uh, moved it into Washington Square Park. And for years, it marked the sort of the beginning or end of uh, any parade uh, in Lower Fifth Avenue. It was a piece of processional architecture and celebratory architecture. Uh, unfortunately, today we uh, can no longer drive through it in our open touring cars because <clears throat> they put these concrete or granite bollards at the bottom. But the next time you're walking around it, uh, take a look at the spandrel in the upper left-hand corner uh, right there. Uh, that is Bessie White uh, carved by uh, Frederick McMonies, the sculptor, uh, as a sort of a present to uh, a woman who had been a gracious hostess for his many visits to Box Hill, their country house. Well, Stanford White knew parties. He was a, what I think we used to call a party animal, but he looked at them as work. I mean, they were work for him. He, uh, that's how he got his clients. The, the woman sitting in the right in that sort of French 18th century ball gown is uh, Mrs. Stuyvesant Fish, who was a client. And he, White complained that he would have to work all day and then have to dress up and go out and do the party thing all night. But he uh, understood that that's how the world worked. Uh, and uh, he did houses with, uh, that were designed for parties. In fact, I've always said that, that you, the best party could be said to be in a room give, designed by Stanford White, that, that uh, he understood that the architecture of uh, spaces in which parties would be held had to give something back and reinforce the sense of the party. Uh, this is a house he designed in Newport in 1902 for Tessie Ulrichs. She was the uh, heiress to the Comstock load fortune, and she was determined to give the best party uh, in a 60-day social season in Newport, and for that uh, she needed the right building, and she went to Stanford White. Stanford White came up with this two-story version of the Grand Trianon, but he really came up with this tour de force of uh, processional celebratory architecture. You um, go down the driveway on the right to go to this party, the carriage would pull up in front of the front door, uh, which you see on the right, you'd get out, uh, you'd go through this triumphal arch, uh, and then at the bottom of the stair, uh, the men would hand their coats off and they would wait at the bottom of the stair while uh, the women would go upstairs, take off their coats, powder their noses, straighten out uh, ball gowns on the likes of uh, Mrs. Stuyvesant Fish, and then they would descend down what I will say has to be the greatest staircase in America. I mean, this is uh, what Stanford White is doing for this party. You're at the best party you've ever been to, and you haven't even gotten to the party yet. I mean, you have to get to the bottom of the stair and still say hello to your hostess. Well, his work from this period, the uh, early 1900s, is of that extremely high level. This is a house on <clears throat> Fifth Avenue between 78th and 79th Street. It was uh, now, it's now the 
uh, cultural services of the French Embassy to the United Nations, but uh, it was a wedding present to uh, Payne Whitney and his wife Helen Hay, uh, given to them by uh, Payne Whitney's uncle Oliver Payne. Oliver Payne basically gave the young couple uh, a blank check, uh, told them to hire Stanford White and build themselves a house. And Stanford White did the absolutely the right thing by that blank check. Um, it's an amazing place. Uh, and uh, but he also started to think about what were the appropriate rooms to have in this. And we are fortunate that two of these rooms are still here. Uh, the first room that he thought about was the entry hall. And here uh, he thought about a building in Rome. Uh, called the uh, Villa Papa Giulia. This was Pope Julius's sort of uh, not quite country, sort of suburban retreat. And it has this wonderful horseshoe shaped ambulatory with that curving uh, vault uh, that has a, a plaster in a trompe l'oeil uh, vision of vines growing around lattice and with these rondels with allegorical figures. And White takes that and he uh, uses the uh, vines and the lattice and the allegorical uh, rondels uh, pretty literally, uh, but in this case, the, the allegorical, allegorical figures are uh, sort of fertility and love, because this was a present for a young couple. Um, but he puts it into this uh, entirely original space where the horseshoe suddenly becomes a circle uh, framed with those paired columns and extraordinary marble. Uh, the shallow dome is now the element that has that uh, trompe l'oeil relief. Um, and the center uh, is a fountain that uh, Stanford White really made out of uh, sort of spare parts. Uh, he would uh, see these pieces in antique dealers' uh, showrooms and he would just buy them uh, for stock almost and then assemble them in this case in this remarkable fountain. This, um, the little boy uh, at the top is now by uh, general agreement, a work of the young Michelangelo. Uh, so he had a very good eye indeed. Well, if you came to this house for a party, uh, your, someone would take your coat and then you would go uh, up that stair on your left. But uh, if you came to have an appointment to see Mr. or Mrs. Whitney, uh, you would be asked to go through those doors on the right and uh, to wait there until uh, they were ready to see you. And this is where you would wait. I mean, if you could, uh, if you could stand it, it's one of the most, again, remarkable rooms in America. This, Mrs. Whitney called this the Venetian room and it's all mirrors around the wall. Uh, the mirror, pieces of mirror are connected by uh, frames that recall the frames of neoclassical pier mirrors. So again, Stanford White is exploring uh, this sort of uh, estuarial interface between architecture and furniture. Um, light is bouncing all over the place. What Stanford White is exploring uh, as again is the idea of creating a texture that is animated by light and then ultimately dissolved by it. And uh, the most remarkable aspect of this room is the cove uh, up at top, which is uh, the, remember the celebrated New England walking tour with its lattice around the porch. Well, now the lattice is made out of bronze and uh, the roses are growing up year round. Uh, I think this was, I'm told this was inspired by the clock, which you see on the left. Uh, which sits on the mantelpiece today. Um, this was another building, unfortunately does not exist. This is the uh, late building, the uh, Madison Square Presbyterian Church, which uh, had a very short lifetime. It was probably completed around uh, 1907 and it was demolished by 1919. Uh, the result of uh, both the congregation uh, moving away from the area around Madison Square up, up Fifth Avenue uh, and also by the uh, needs of the Metropolitan Life Insurance Company and eventually uh, the MetLife made uh, what remained of the congregation an offer they couldn't refuse uh, and the building was taken apart uh, and bits of that building reappear in other buildings kind of around uh, around town and around New England. But um, you can see, if you look at the uh, photograph on the right of the whole church, Stanford White, again, using this uh, sort of dense ornament, uh, which is then relieved by passages of rel relatively plain, but still lightly animated surfaces, in this case, this uh, uh, brick with a light uh, range. Uh, and then if you look at the photograph on the left, you see what that dense ornament is like. I mean, this, you could not conceivably squeeze another single detail uh, into that 
um, cornice, that is made out of a glazed terracotta that was the green and yellow, and it must have been absolutely splendid. It was, um, some people consider this to be uh, Stanford White's uh, best building. But while this shows how Stanford White could step on the gas, uh, another building of his very last uh, set of works shows how he could step on the brake. Uh, this is the Prison Ship Martyrs Monument at Fort Greene Park. Uh, the structure that was uh, erected to commemorate the memory of the 3,000 colonial prisoners of war who died in prison ships, uh, a really disgraceful episode in the history of war. Uh, but here Stanford White is taking uh, the column, which is a, a, a Greek element in funerary uh, design, uh, and he's just using this sort of baseless uh, fluted Tuscan column uh, with only that tripod lamp at the top as the only ornament or decoration in this whole uh, tableau. And um, the absence of decoration is what makes this work uh, so incredibly powerful and gives it uh, uh, the, the gravity that it has today. Well, this picture was taken in around, must have been June or July in uh, 1905. And um, it shows a picnic at Box Hill, which was Stanford White's country house in St. James, Long Island. Uh, there you see Stanford White sitting uh, on the blanket. Bessie is tugging his ear. Uh, the white hat of, with his back to the camera, that is Charles McKim uh, in the rocking chair in the far left and the middle ground rather is uh, Augusta St. Gaudens. And um, you know, 30 years earlier, these three what were then redheads, they now all had gray hair, uh, just went off on this kind of carefree lark to the south of France. And now they were at the absolute pinnacle of their professions. I mean, St. Gaudens was designing the coinage for the United States Mint. Uh, Charles McKim had just been awarded uh, the gold medal, or had accepted the gold medal from the Royal Institute of British Architects. And Stanford White was at this point the most visible architect in America. And uh, within a little more than a year, it was all over. Stanford White is shot by a madman. Uh, St. Gaudens dies of uh, cancer. You can see him looking suffering in the background there. And McKim would die within a year uh, of a broken heart. Uh, but uh, it is a remarkable photograph because these three uh, men at their peak uh, represent a period of 30 years uh, of American art. And uh, in that, they were the most significant players. That brings me to the end. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Sam. Um, well, you're um, very welcome. Um, wonderful, wonderful. Um, people are saying thank you in the chat. Thank you, and that it was a wonderful talk. Um, and um, yeah, we've got a few questions. Um, so I'll just, I'll just get started. Um, we actually had one question, as Ariel mentioned, that was sent in um, ahead of time by one of our friends at uh, Judson Memorial Church. Um, I know that you already touched on Judson a little bit, but um, you just wanted to know if there are any um, significant details at Judson um, in the design that that um, feel interesting to point out? Well, I think I, I did mention the entry porch and, the, uh, and that extraordinary rustication. Great. There we are. Okay. Um, uh, the, the porch and the rustication, the interior, the windows inside, I think, are by Lafarge. Uh, but it is, it's interesting that he, he kind of put it all into the front door on that one because it's a very uh, it's a plain interior, uh, and I think that was intentional. I think that was part of the, uh, the, again, what I say, the spirit of the program was that they wanted a plain interior, whereas there were other churches that probably wanted uh, much fancier interiors. So I think it's very, it, it's um, kind of directness of that interior space is something special about that church. Great, thank you. Um, see we're getting a, a couple of more questions coming into the chat um and i just ask if people have more questions if you could just put those into the q a actually just so we can collect them all in one place 
um, but I am taking note of the ones that are that are now being posted in the chat. Um, so um, I had another question that came um, during during the talk earlier on in the talk when you were speaking about the the New England walking tour. Um, and forgive me, I forget exactly when this question was asked, but um, someone named Nancy um, had a question about, um, I believe they had visited New Hampshire during their walking tour and someone had a question um, saying where, where in New Hampshire? Port, um, Portsmouth, New Hampshire. I mean, that's Portsmouth is the great repository of that federal period architecture. I mean, interestingly, Stanford White, um, the, the building that I showed you that he designed, the uh, Charles Dana Gibson House, is one of the early examples of the federal revival. Uh, that, uh, that's a style that became very popular in the teens and 20s with the sort of second generation of classicists like Delano and Aldrich. But uh, when Stanford White did it, uh, nobody had seen a federal house for, uh, at this point, for about 60 years. And so uh, he was one of the first of the Re federal revival architects, but it shows how he could, I mean, he could do plain and he could do f fancy, but when he did plain, it was very, very elegant. Thank you. Um, someone has asked, is Stanford White's home in St. James still extant? The answer is yes. It's, uh, it's owned by my brother and sister-in-law, and uh, uh, it's a real privilege to be able to go and see it. It's, a, uh, it's, it's their house. It's a private house, but they, uh, uh, Stanford White developed that. I, if you look at some of those books that we wrote, we, get, we have a lot of pictures of the interior. You don't have to get out to St. James to see it. You can just see it by buying a book at this point. Great. Thank you. And um, that just, that reminds me, many people were asking um, if you are related to, to Stanford White. Um, oh. <laughs> and I'd answer some people in the chat, but I can't. <laughs> well, yes, yeah, Stanford, Stanford White was my great grandfather. I mean, everybody has um, four great grandfathers. And so he was one of four of my great grandfathers. Looking the other way, uh, there were about, at this point, there were probably about 50 of us who are descended from Stanford White. So, uh, uh, and a huge number of them are architects. Uh, it, um, so uh, he, he had one child, but it expands from there. Great. Yeah, someone actually just popped in and asked, are there other architects in the family? Short and, answer, yes. They, yes. Uh, yes. And they're all good, too. You can, uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, somewhat related to that, but, but not, you know, somewhat different. Someone is asking, is there a direct lineage of White's firm, um, of the architecture firm? The, uh, that's a good question. The, uh, the firm existed until 1956, uh, after Stanford White and McKim and Mead, uh, White and McKim uh, have died on the job, as it were. Uh, uh, Mead retired from the firm and went to Rome to be the uh, director of the American Academy in Rome. Uh, a second generation of partners took over from there. And then uh, my grandfather, Larry, uh, Larry White, who was Stanford White's son, uh, was the leader of the third generation of partners. Uh, and when he died in 1956, the firm went out of business. It, it dissolved. Um, someone wants to know um, if there are any memorials to White and um, where he's buried. I'm not sure if you, you might have mentioned where he's buried in the talk, but are there any memorials? He buried in the, in the uh, Episcopal Church uh, graveyard cemetery in St. James, New York, in a, with a stone very similar to the stone that uh, he had designed for Joseph Morrow Wells, that very tall uh, stele based on Greek. Uh, you can go to the Metropolitan Museum and you can see, you can see it in the original. Um, and they're, they're wonderful things, but he is, a, uh, that is where he is buried. Okay. Um, so I'm just going to grab these last couple of questions that were in the chat just to make sure that I don't forget them. Um, this one is pretty specific. Um, <laughs> can you comment on the rosettes um, inside Judson and the Washington Square arch? I cannot. I think that that's a, I'd have to look at them. And <laughs> so I can't conjure them up from memory at this point. So that's, uh, where's the button that says too hard? 
Yes, fair enough. Fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> you can't can't know every every single detail. Um, uh, let's see. So, um, so um, Donna, I see, um, has asked. Um, she said, "Thank you for for telling me more about this magnificent building." Um, uh, let's see. Um, I'm I'm actually gonna I'm not sure this is actually a question I'm sorry, <laughs> but this person does say um, uh, thank you thank you so much um, the, this building is you she loves the comment about the spirit of the places that he made. Um, well, you're very very welcome. It's it, it is it's remarkable. Those buildings are remarkable in that respect. Yes, absolutely absolutely agreed. I mean I think I, I at one point I called it the architecture of empathy because it's just mm -hmm. the building is in conversation with the with the observer. That's great. That's great. Love that. Um, let's see. Um, okay, let me move on. Um, someone wants to know what is the name of the decorative process using um, pebbles and beer bottle bases and cement? I call, I call them sgraffito, S-G-R-A-F-F-I-T-O, which is a, probably a, either a made up word or a word relating to something else, but it's the only word that I've ever scene that sort of comes close to this uh, sort of sense. It's pebble dash if it's just pebbles, but uh, scraffito if, it, if it's creating a kind of an image in the plaster by applying things to it. So if, if, if I'm wrong, I'm wrong. <laughs> but uh, that's the word that I use. Sounds pretty good to me. <laughs> um, let's, let's see. Um, Someone wants to know, do any plans exist for the buildings originally planned for Governor's Island um, at the request of Secretary of War, Elihu Root? Um, I don't know those plans. So I don't know the answer to that. I know that the building um, in, in Governor's Island, which is the huge, huge, immensely long, like quarter of a mile long uh, Georgian, building that looks like a dormitory in an Ivy League college on steroids. Uh, that was designed by uh, the, sec the third generation of partners, second and third generation, uh, and uh, has just a wonderful archway with this English Baroque uh, archway that has real muscle muscles to it, uh, uh, worth taking a look at because the, uh, the building, the rest of the building is just so huge that uh, they came up with this uh, sort of almost exaggerated architecture to try to uh, balance it. Um, an interesting question here. Um, do you think ornament has a role to play in today's architecture? And do you know any present firms attempting to keep it alive? Well, it's, you know, ornament is a kind of a dirty word these days, just as, a, as memory is a dirty word too. Uh, <laughs> but, um, uh, but yes, I mean, we'll start with, um, I mean, if you look at Lou Kahn's uh, buildings in, uh, in India that have a, <clears throat> sort of a marble. He used uh, strips of marble every four feet as he was going, making these pours of concrete. And the marble that he used had a little gold in it. And so uh, it's very ornamental. I mean, here is the, uh, <clears throat> the, 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 the absolute epitome of a, of a kind of a formalist, brutalist architect using ornament. So uh, yes, you just uh, it's not going to be the ornament that Stanford White used, but ornament uh, is always part of architecture. I think even Mies van der Rohe would use the, you know, the heads of the bolts as ornament. Thank you. <clears throat> Let's see. Um, Adelaide wants to know, how is it to work on these amazing buildings now, helping them to continue to be used and loved in the modern world? A real privilege is the short answer. <laughs> they are, uh, uh, they are just wonderful buildings. They aren't, you know, they are made, and you get to see them at a number of levels. I mean, the construction technology is interesting. Um, the decoration is interesting. The 
kind of robustness of the structure is interesting. I mean, they're just wonderful buildings to work on. That's great. Um, let's see. Oh, um, where did White find the craftsmen to make the amazing ornament? <clears throat> it's a good question. I, th I think the answer is that at this moment in America, there was an influx of craftsmen from Europe. I mean, there was a great migration of, of highly skilled uh, wood carvers, metal workers, uh, mosaic tile uh, people from Italy, wood carvers from Germany. And I think that was the source of this sort of incredible workmanship. Um, a couple of people want to know, um, what is your favorite Stanford White structure in New York? Uh, Washington Square. Washington Memorial Arch, hands down. Mm -hmm. Second place would be the Gould Memorial Library. And I'm, I've been working with Bronx Community College for the last couple of years and a group of preservationists trying to um, sort of return that building to active use, uh, part of which is to restore it. And uh, so we are now uh, just replacing the uh, those famous uh, Sh uh, shingles that are like fa copper shingles that are like fish scales, they are being replaced uh, thanks to a uh, $12 million grant from the city and the state. Uh, so uh, that building was leaking and we are fixing the roof. Step one in preserving a building. Hmm. <clears throat> um, Someone wants to know, um, Stanford White, did, uh, did he do the interior dome, if you know this, um, within the Al Hirschfeld Gallery on East 9th Street? The, which, could you repeat the name of the gallery? Sure, the Al Hirschfeld Gallery on East 9th oh. Street. No, I, would, I think the answer is no. But I, but I don't know because they did so much work that you just have to be really careful about saying no until you look at it, you look at the records and you check. So <laughs> what well, well, I say, if he did, I don't know it. To be determined. <laughs> okay. Um, <clears throat> let's see. Um, did Stanford White contribute to the University Club or was that all designed by Charles McKim? That's considered to be pure McKim, but at this point, the, um, uh, the ornament within it is done by a, an office that I think Stanford White had trained. I mean, I think they, they understood what his <laughs> expectations for ornament was. And McKim, as we have seen, had a much more restrained taste in uh, applied architectural ornament. and so. Uh, McKim was not going to scoop up the ice cream to the degree that Stanford White did, uh, but the people who developed those ornamental details were people who knew what Stanford White's expectations were for quality and uh, craftsmanship. <clears throat> okay. Just a couple more, I think. Thank you everyone for asking so many detailed questions. Um, we really, really appreciate it. And um, thank you, Sam, for your thorough answers. Um, let's see. Um, Kelly wants to know, if Stanford White had no formal architectural training, um, what, what led him to the employ of H.H. H. Richardson? What's the connection there? Good, good question. Um, the answer is that Stanford White's father was Richard Grant White, who was, he was a journalist, he was a Shakespeare scholar, he was a, <clears throat> I, he, uh, and he knew sort of everybody in New York. He was one of those people. New York was a relatively small town and uh, Stanford White originally wanted to be a painter, but uh, his father sent him to see John Lafarge uh, and John Lafarge told him that being a painter was a terrible career uh, in terms of being able to support yourself. And so, uh, Lafarge suggested architecture. Stanford White reports this back to his father. His father talks to Olmsted. Olmsted talks to Richardson, and the young man gets a job. 
What a story. Um, it's known as getting it the old fashioned way. <laughs> Um, so we have a question um, asking where did Stanford White and Bessie live? Um, they, um, they lived, they had three houses in New York. They first lived, I think, on 18th Street and then on, uh, then they moved to <coughs> Gramercy Park. They lived uh, in a townhouse uh, on Gramercy Park that's now uh, probably the, uh, uh, if you look at the private dining room in uh, Mylino, the restaurant, uh, that is where that townhouse was uh, years ago. And then uh, around 1901, they rented the townhouse next door, which was right at the corner of Lexington Avenue and 21st Street facing Gramercy Park. And uh, they lived there, uh, Stafford White improved that just enormously. It really made an amazing house out of it. Uh, he did not own it. He was renting it and, uh, uh, and he lived there until his death. When he died, uh, the house was taken back by the owner of the house, H.A.C. Uh, Taylor, uh, and it was, uh, the interiors were auctioned off. Uh, the uh, house was used for a while uh, by a, I think a couple of clubs. I think there was a uh, metropolitan, there was a city club or something like that that used it and then the Princeton club used it and then eventually it was torn down uh, to create the uh, Gramercy Park Hotel. Great, thank you. Um, thanks again for all of these questions. They just keep coming in um, and unfortunately we don't have time to answer every single one of them. We would be here all night. Um, but again, just really appreciate everyone's um, curiosity and interest. Um, and let's see, yeah, I just wanted to close it out by asking um, Ted's questions. Um, who, do you, who are the architects today that you think are, um, are carrying out your great-grandfather's legacy? Um, that is really a tricky question. And I would have to think for a long time. I mean, the, I will say that um, you know, 50 years ago was a kind of a low point in American architecture. I mean, not only was <clears throat> Stanford White's legacy not valued at all, but uh, I think architects were really confused and now architects are terrific. I mean, there's so many good architects out there. You look at, I mean, look at what uh, uh, Diller Scafidio did to Lincoln Center. I think it's absolutely brilliant. And, uh, and you just go on and on and on. Uh, so uh, I couldn't stop at one, I would have to say. Good answer. All right, well, I think that's all the time we have now for questions. Thank you again so much, Sam, for such an amazing talk. And thank you everyone um, for coming and making it so special. And thank, thanks so much again to, um, to Judson and to the Monticelli Press and to our October. Um, if, if any of you are here, we just are so, so grateful. Um, and we look forward to more programs together. And um, just to, to answer folks' uh, question, questions, um, we are gonna send a follow-up email probably tomorrow, hopefully. Um, which will include the link to the video of this talk and many of the other links that we have been sharing throughout throughout the event, especially um, to purchase the book, uh, which Lena just also put into the chat. So please, please do that. Um, support our, our writers and, and our partners and support our, our village preservation. So thank you so much to everyone for being here. Thanks, everyone. Take good care. Thanks again, Sam. Bye. You're welcome, Ariel. Have a great night, everyone.